Rebecca Joanna and the president of the Natural Science Association of St. Joseph's College. It is my immense pleasure to welcome everyone to the 44th National Virtual Conference on Animal Behavior in association with the Ecological Society of India. The focal theme for this year is human wildlife conflict. Sit back and listen to all the insightful talks put together by our speakers as they walk you through their experience with animals and their behaviors. I would like to I would like to inform about two things. So there will at the end of the session for the day, there will be a sent to attendance form, one for the presenters and one for the participants. Kindly uh, fill in the attendance form to uh, and a feedback form will be sent shortly to generate your certificates. Thank you. Over to Ms. Over to Dr. Putul Banerjee, Associate Professor of, of the Zoology Department of St. Joseph's College to give the introduc introductory message for the speaker. Thank you, Rebecca, and a very good morning to one and all present. On behalf of the organizing committee, I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed dignitaries, Professor Shakuntala Sridhar, President, Ethological Society of India, our chief guest, Dr. Driti Banerjee, Director, Zoological Survey of India, Dr. BPS Verma, Chief Conservator of Forests, and Chief Wildlife Warden, Gujarat, Dr. Beatrice Sequera, Dean School of Life Sciences, St. Joseph's College, and Head of the Department of Zoology and Coordinator of Natural Science Association, Dr. Jay Shankar. All our dear students, research scholars, faculty members, and delegates who have joined us from all over India to attend the 44th National Conference on Animal Behavior and the annual meetings of the Ethological Society of India in this virtual platform. It is a matter of proud privilege for all of us here at the Department of Zoology in St. Joseph's College, Bangalore, to host the meet in partnership with the Ethological Society of India. Our college has a history of 137 years imparting graduate education and research. The government of Karnataka, in due recognition of its credentials, declared it as an autonomous college in 2005. The college is re-accredited by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council, NAC, with a grade of A++, securing a CGPA of 3.79 out of 4 in March 2017, which is the highest in India. UGC has also declared St. Joseph's College as a College of Excellence. The college is also funded by DBT, under the STAR Scholar Scheme. In keeping with the excellent academic traditions of the college, the Department of Zoology has also made its mark as an important teaching and learning center of life sciences and particularly animal sciences at the undergraduate level, preparing students for advanced studies and in in the emerging interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary fields such as genetic engineering, wildlife and conservation, ecology and animal behavior. The National Science Association, NSA of the department, is one of the oldest associations actively involved in science communication and organizing scientific meets at all levels, that is local, national, and international levels on a variety of subjects. These meets had been providing our students with the right kind of exposure so that they discover their area of interest and strive towards it. Thanks to the pandemic, virtual meets have become very common and NSA has grabbed the opportunity to organize frequent webinars and conferences during the past one and a half years. 
the present national conference on animal behavior is one of those where all participants will get an opportunity to listen to the stalwarts from the field of ethology from across india as well as get a platform to present their work in front of a larger scientific audience i truly hope that this national conference is just a beginning of a long and fruitful association of nsa of st joseph's college with the ethological society of india so i wish you all two days of very fruitful scientific deliberations discussions and wish that new collaborations are built between like minded participants from different parts of india during this virtual meet once again i extend a hearty welcome to you all thank you thank you dr putul uh, for the welcome speech and also setting tone for the two day uh, national conference on uh, an recent trends in animal behavior we now have uh, dr shakuntala sridhara the president of the ethological society of india uh, to address the gathering uh, we are happy to have this association with the ethological society of india in organizing this conference thanks to madam and over to you madam dr shakuntala sridhara the president of esi uh thank you jay shankar good morning to all the yes, greeter is present can uh, you hear me uh, yeah uh, you're audible uh, uh, you can also turn on the video if you wish to yeah. uh ashwant you can uh, stop sharing the slide so that madam can share the video Can you see me? Uh, not yet, ma'am. Uh, I hope uh, can Dr. Putul confirm? Uh, not yet. Not yet, ma'am. No. You have to turn on the video. Mm. The camera, you have to turn on. Meanwhile, I keep on uh, talking. Okay, ma'am. I'll let the visual come on in its due course. Uh, dignitaries present, dear delegates, it gives me immense pleasure to address you all in this inaugural function. The occasion is memorable because this year is the 50th year of activities of Ethological Society of India. This society was born when studies in zoology were limited to specializations at postgraduate level only to cytology and embryology in early 70s and 60s. The Nobel Prize won by three zoologists, namely Lawrence, Tinbergen and Frisch, ignited the importance of studies on animal behavior. Zoologists all over the world woke up to the potential of studies in ethology for understanding many aspects of science and social sciences. India was no exception to this trend. The man instrumental for the birth of Ethological Society of India was Professor S.A. Barnett, a British behavior biologist of great repute, especially for his studies on the behavior of rats. He motivated the eminent zoologists of India to come together and form the Ethological Society of India in 1971 with my alma mater, University of Agricultural Sciences, Bangalore, as its headquarters. I am extremely fortunate that I was trained by Barnett in the beginning of my career on studies on rodents. This 44th Animal Conference on Behavior is sponsored by the Ethological Society of India and St. Joseph's College Autonomous Bangalore is very unique for two reasons. Ethologists across India are spontaneously participating in large numbers in this conference, a feat which under normal circumstances is ordinary, but the enthusiastic participation 
in a virtual conference when India is re still reeling under the pandemic of COVID-19 is an occasion for jubilation and reflection of scientists' unwavered passion for research on animal behavior. Secondly, for the first time in the history of Ethological Society of India, the National Conference on Ethology and the annual meetings of the society are organized in a private prestigious autonomous college, St. Joseph's, as against the tradition of being hosted in headquarters of universities and national research centers across the country hitherto. This pioneering step, I am sure, will infuse interest in animal behavior in undergraduate and postgraduate students of zoology, the study of which has immense value in conservation of biodiversity, management of animals that affect humans in several areas, such as agricultural productivity, diseases, animal husbandry, livestock rearing, and welfare of animals, including pets. This year, the conference is focusing on an issue of vital importance both for humans and animals, namely the conflict between humans and wildlife, which is not only due to reduced area of habitat, but its deterioration consequent to developmental activities and over exploitation of natural resources. Many eminent speakers are going to highlight the magnitude of this problem and its mitigation. This apart, as usual, the conference will have presentations and deliberations on ethology of several species of Indian animals. St. Joseph's College is celebrating more than 100 years of imparting quality education this year. The Ethological Society of India is proud to share their glory of centenary celebrations, hoping that Many of its alumni will emerge as scientists of international, international repute in ethology and contribute towards the welfare of both humans and animals. Let us make this occasion a memorable one, both in imbibing the advances made in ethology in the country and inspiring the young students to take up studies on animal behavior in a country of rich biodiversity of fauna, such as India. I wish you all the best, and I hope at the end of this conference, all of us are more knowledgeable and more inspired to study animal behavior. Thank you. I thank the organizers, especially Jay Shankar and the Uh, did somebody mute everyone? Ma'am, uh, you're not audible. Shakuntala, ma'am, can you hear me? Okay, there is some issue. The student uh, coordinators who are trying to mute people when you hear them talk, please uh, don't go for uh, muting everyone or uh, all of them. Just mute the concerned participant only. If you go for an all mute, it will mute the speaker also. Uh, this is uh, for the students organizers to note. Uh, Shakuntala, ma'am, you can go ahead, please. Uh... You want me to go from the beginning? I was not no, audible. No, no, You were ah. audible. Uh, the last, the fact, and you were thanking the principal. The last part of my speech. Yes. Uh, this year, the conference is focusing on an issue of vital importance, both for humans and animals, namely the conflict between humans and wildlife not only due to reduced area of habitat, but its deterioration consequent to developmental activities and over exploitation of natural resources. Many eminent speakers are going to highlight the magnitude of this problem and its mitigation today. 
and tomorrow. This apart, as usual, the conference will have presentations and deliberations on ethology of several species of, species of animals uh, from more than 80 participants, I suppose. St. Joseph's College is celebrating more than 100 years of imparting quality education this year. The Ethological Society of India is proud to share their glory of centenary celebrations, hoping that many of its alumni will emerge as scientists of international repute in ethology and contribute towards the welfare of both humans and animals. Let us make this occasion a memorable one, both in imbibing the advances made in ethology in the country and inspiring young students to take up studies in animal behavior in a country of rich biodiversity of fauna such as India. I wish you all the best and at the end of conference, I am sure we all will be more knowledgeable about the advances of made in ethology in this country and contribute much more towards this subject. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it's over to Dr. Patul to introduce uh, our chief guest for the conference uh, inaugural ceremony. Dr. Patul. Thank you, Dr. Jay Shankar. It's my privilege to introduce the chief guest for this conference. Dr. Dhriti Banerjee joined as the Director Zoological Survey of India on the 6th of August 2021. She was the first woman to grace the chair in the 105 year history of the Zoological Survey of India, a premier research institute on faunal biodiversity and conservation under the aegis of Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change. A Presidency College graduate, she began her research career on the physiological effects of sustained use of abusive drugs in human and animals and was awarded several fellowships and grants for her research projects. On com completion of her PhD, she joined Zoological Survey of India in 1998 as a junior research scientist. Biodiversity faunal documentation and molecular species characterization was her forte. Her studies were focused on taxonomy, conservation, molecular systematics, and biodiversity of diptera. She has initiated molecular research in Jedasai and at present is involved in pollinator species mapping and vector modeling. Known as the lady of the flies, she is now into the science of criminal forensics and is trying to find suitable model of criminal forensic fly species, which can be used for crime detection in Indian environmental conditions to aid law enforcing agencies. Dr. Banerjee is also the lady behind digi digital genocide, an extremely ambitious program, which with futuristic goals of integrating artificial intelligence into biodiversity research. It also would mean a complete genetic information on Indian fauna, as well as its distribution information over time and space. This web-based this web -based information would enable all researchers, wildlife enthusiasts, students, and anyone interested in biodiversity to access the spe specimens in the National Zoological Collection and the fauna of India by a click of a mouse. Dr. Banerjee has authored several books, research articles in peer review journals, and quite a few popular articles in vernaculars as well. Dr. Banerjee has conducted several awareness programs for students of biodiversity studies and has delivered several talks on popular scientific topics aired by Akash Bani and Doordarshan. She is a member of more than 15 learned societies, both international and national, and has worked closely with the Ramakrishna Mission and Rotary Foundation 
and was a member of an all women rotary club she was recently conferred with the award of exceptional woman of excellence by the women's economic forum at the hague the netherlands on the international women's day 2018 i once again extend a warm welcome to you ma'am over to you am i audible yes ma'am and am i visible yes ma'am okay so namaskar a very good morning to all of you and thank you putul for your kind words uh, i have to say uh, one thing here my mother in law was her name was also putul so they i i guess we have bonded instantly so thank you very much once again a very good morning to all the organizers uh, organizers of the virtual conference national virtual conference on recent trends in animal behavior organized by the ethological society of india and st joseph's college bangalore senior scientists research scholars students ladies and gentlemen it's indeed a matter of great pleasure for me to join this august gathering on the wildlife conservation of wildlife conservation and management professionals who are all attending this 44th national conference on annual behavior and uh, annual meeting of the ethological society of india from different parts of the country i'm very grateful to dr m jayashankar organizing secretary of the conference for giving me this opportunity to share my view on this subject i guess i am addressing the students the msc bsc msc and phd students in st joseph's college isn't it am i right yes ma'am and also students from all over the country they are also and taking students, part and students from all over the country so i'll be uh, speaking briefly on what this human wildlife conflict is all about and i would also like to address these students because on how to prepare their way forward in their life in future maybe a little bit if there is time to so i am aware that this national conference is organized by the ethological society of india every year and the present one is a 44th and it holds a very special position in the sentiments of the scientific fraternity working towards animal behavior wildlife conservation in india this ethological society as i uh, if i am not wrong as uh, flagged by uh just by previous speaker that it is uh it is on his stepped on his 50th year and i guess this happens to be a very important landmark in your organization too in fact this conference gives an opportunity to professionals like me and many others present today in this virtual meeting to build knowledge about various scientific aspects such as ecology behavior climate biology chronobiology and the best practices that are currently available i am aware of the fact that this forum intends not only to showcase the research work which the researchers are doing but also to provide new and robust solutions for better conservation and management of the natural resources of our mega diverse country this year the theme on human wildlife conflict has been aptly taken up by the organizations because throughout the world human wildlife conflict management has become very challenging on one hand we are saying you protect and you preserve and you conserve on the other hand when the animals which are being protected are encroaching upon human habitations it is putting the managers in a very uh, in a paradoxical situations where leave which is leaving the managers in an extremely confused state to do or what not to do so the human wildlife conflict is currently one of the most pressing conservation challenges hwc always often and often involves wild animals consuming anthropogenic resources such as crop or livestock either out of necessity because of loss of habitat and natural prey or as a consequence of opportunistic behavior i may the animal may need the food the animal may just chance upon the food so that's the reason which starts the issue of all the conflict in some of the cases the human wildlife conflict also leads to human casualties and grievous injuries this leads to the a lot of pressure in fact this puts a lot of pressure on the managers of the protected areas as well as on the managers of the fringe fringe areas as well as on the law enforcement law enforcement agencies and the government all together 
A variety of interventions have been undertaken to reduce the human wildlife conflict, differing in practicality, costs, and social acceptance. But there is no proverbial silver bullet for mitigating the human wildlife conflict. The study of animal behavior is foundational to solving issues of coexistence between people and wild animals. However, there, is, there are a number of questions which need to be addressed for dealing with the human wildlife conflict too. Number one, how is behavioral ecology relevant to deal with the increasing conflict? Number two, are advancements and understanding and the mechanism by which animals process information and making decisions being translated into management methods? Number three, how the management methods, including practices and strategies made previously, are effective in dealing with the human wildlife conflicts. It's a shocking reality, dear friends, that several species of animals and birds and other taxonomic groups are standing on the verge of extinction due to poaching, illegal trading, loss of habitat, pollution, and deforestation. On top of it, this growing human wildlife conflict is an additional challenge, which is posing before the wildlife conservationists and the wildlife managers which is growing today in leaps and bounds. As many animals are removed either by managers as a consequence of it or by local conflicts to mitigate conflicts, whom to save, the animal or the man. The disturbing fact is that the scientific fraternity, like, like the ones who are present here today in this August gathering, predicted that if science-driven conservation steps are not taken, our coming generations would not only be able to see any of the animals in living conditions, so they may all end up seeing their animated versions in movies or photographs in the textbooks. However, as a famous idiom goes, it's better late than never. Since, the government, since then, the governments, officials, scientists, civil society organizations, and wildlife conservation bodies have all come together in this quest of wildlife conservation in India in general, and specifically dealing with the human wildlife conflicts. However, I believe that there is a need to examine and understand the theoretical and applied aspects. There's a lot of background noise, Dr. Shankar. Yes, ma'am. I'm rectifying. I'm muting the parts. OK, thank you. So anyway, so I believe that there is a need to examine and understand the theoretical and applied aspects of the conflicting animal behavior in mitigating the human wildlife conflict. Within the context of livestock depredation by the carnivores, our understanding of individual predator behavior relative to the perceived risk and factors which is contributing to the development of problem individuals will influence the efficacy of the most promising non-lethal management approaches. One such non-lethal intervention is animal conditioning, a technique which is introduced to reduce conflict by modifying the behavior of problem animals. Despite the potential of such interventions in reducing human wildlife conflict, conflict, much of it is not usually applied. We basically tend to remove the animal or they are either killed by the civilians on which they are predating upon or, or whose interests they are stepping upon. And that is the general practice of basically mitigating the conflicts. I could see the program schedule of the conference covers much of the conservation facets, and I hope that the presentations during the technical session will also provide knowledge and solutions for better conservation and management of the wildlife in this country. Especially, I do look forward to the outcomes which is going to contribute towards enhancing our knowledge about these use of animal behavior in mitigating the growing problem of human wildlife conflict in the country, and I guess the Ethological Society of India will have a long and a very uh, important role to play in this phenomenon, in this proce process of how, how to go ahead for mitigating the conflicts and aiding the conservation managers as well as the policymakers in helping them to look forward to a much brighter future so that both conservation measures can be stepped up and human wildlife conflict maybe basically maybe handled and stepped down. I'm sure that through the thought-provoking session, which is being addressed, 
by uh, by my previous speaker on the subject matter as well as all the experts who are present here they will be immensely benefiting all the budding minds of our country and all the college students who are present here today so uh, what i would like to say that any kind of conflict mitigation always starts off with a with a sense of empathy in you the empathy which has to be basically fostered amongst the college students the school students the phd researchers the empathy may be towards your friend it may be towards your colleague maybe towards your partner maybe towards your uh, anybody who is less privileged than you i guess this empathy concept somehow is being taking a back seat in this extremely competitive environment which we have today as to all the students who are present here i would like to say lend a helping hand to somebody who is slightly less privileged than you the happiness of it will go a long way in your future and you building your career in future too and this basic empathy will help you to understand why conservation is important why wildlife protection is important and what would be your role in preserving conserving and augmenting the biodiversity of our beautiful country at the end i would say that it is always a pleasure for me to be present myself in such gatherings where there are so many college students and i guess we do have a role to build the, you are the nation builders of tomorrow so as a chief guest of this national conference i am very happy to be addressing this gathering i would once again like to express my gratitude to the conference organization and a very special thanks to dr jay shankar i guess he was a part of zsi once upon a time and hence he remembered me and uh, and basically wanted me to act as a chief guest in this program so thank you dr jay shankar once again and thank you all the organization organizing committee members and the organizing secretary for giving me a chance to interact with your students and to share my views with all of you thank you very much namaskar jay hind Dr. Jay Shankar, I'm done. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that thought-provoking uh, inaugural address. Yes, it has surely ignited many young minds who are inspiring to be part of research and also to contribute towards animal diversity and related field in our country, one of the mega biodiverse countries in the world, and also many who are aspiring to get into the zoological survey of India. Excuse me, uh, just a minute. Can you have your camera switched on? Because I can't okay, see okay. any one of you. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm just turning on. Yeah. I've just turned on my camera. Okay, okay. Yeah, I can see you now. Okay. Yeah. Bangalore has kept us cold. So I'm just okay. wrapped up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Thank go you. ahead. Go ahead. Thank go you ahead. for accepting our invitation, ma'am, to be here as the chief guest uh, for this two-day uh, national conference, which is held virtually, uh, and uh, inspiring youngsters, as I said, many of whom are aspiring to be part of uh, organizations like the Zoological Survey of India. a premier institute that is involved in documenting animal diversity that is what also pulled me and to get in uh, to work in arunachal pradesh aprc uh, scientrcy uh, yes again the passion for teaching is what got me back to my alma mater where i am sitting now uh, saint joseph college to teach zoology i am always motivating students who are aspiring to get into the design other organizations which are working towards contributing to the diversity studies in our country so uh, thank you ma'am thank you for that uh, dr putul banerji you connected instantaneously uh, putul you want to putul banerji happens to be my mother in law that's okay. why i can <laughs> my mother in law's <laughs> name <laughs> uh, i hope you share a very cordial relation with your mother in law i did i do i do i do <laughs> <Wait>. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so for. If there are any uh, questions, you can address it address to my email if there is anything yes. you want to ask. So, <laughs> thank you very much once again, Namaskar. Yes, so, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, being with us. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Putul has anything to share? You can. If not, we will uh, move ahead.
Uh, yes. Sir, we can move ahead, maybe. Yes. Okay, yes. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for being with us. Anything, we'll get back to you. Uh, we require your uh, support and association in uh, futures to come. We are planning to uh, have uh, multiple courses, including wildlife and also a PG program. Uh, so we will be reaching out to you, the Premier Institute, and you in the seat. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks Thank a lot. You. You're sure. You're always welcome. Good morning once again, and thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, dear participants, there was a technical glitch. Uh, we couldn't play the college anthem. It's formality that we begin every program with uh, playing of the college anthem. So I now request Abhishek to play the college anthem, uh, which we start uh, with which we start every conference and program uh, in St. Joseph's College. Abhishek. If you're there, if you could share the anthem plate, yeah. For us to observe. Abhishek, uh, we now have the first keynote address of the conference uh, by Dr. DPS Verma. I request Rebecca to share the PowerPoint as well as introduce her. Over to you, Rebecca. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, Yashwan, can you please share the PPT? Yeah, yeah, sharing one second. Yeah. Um, I'll start with the introduction. So, I've, for, so our first speaker for today is Dr. DPS Verma, former principal, chief conservator of forest and chief wildlife warden, Gujarat, serves an expert in environmental awareness, sustainability, natural resource management, biodiversity and forestry. Sir holds a bachelor degree in agriculture and he has done his post-graduation in forestry and PhD in farm and community forestry, and has written a lot of national and international journals on forestry matters. He has also undergone a forestry management course at the University of Oxford. Sir has 35, experience, 35 years of work experience in forestry, and his specialization is in the field of farm and community social forestry. Currently, he is a freelance consultant on forestry matters. Over to you, Verma, sir. I, can you unmute, sir? Okay. Thank you. Yes, can sir. you hear you me? Can, you can start. Yes, sir, Thank I can. You. you can start with your Thank you. Thank you. Uh, respected Sakuntala ji, my colleague Gita Bali, learned friends, ladies and gentlemen. Let me make it... Uh, very clear from the beginning that uh, like you all, I am not an accommodation. I am a practitioner who has been handling human wildlife conflict uh, spread over three decades. <clears throat> now, can you start putting up my slides, madam? Or oh, it is not possible for you to put. You can go to next. Hello? Uh, your slide is seen, uh, sir. 
ఇంట్రొడక్షన్స్ట్రొడక్షన్ it is there is that's the major reason why this conflict <coughs> is growing day by day in spite of the fact that we have about 100 national parks and over 500 centuries despite this you see as on today about 30 to 35 species are involved in this conflict <coughs> the conflict of course has a different dimension in case of lion because of the nature of the animal and the attitude of the stock stakeholders living in and around the gir lion sanctuary if you look at the if you look at the slide you see in gujarat lion is not the main killer of uh, human beings this is a figure of last 7 years so from 2012 to 19 over the last 3 years four more death have been added so on an average the death has been uh, varying one and two persons only so this shows that you see this animal uh, it is not of such a difficult uh, nature that is causing a great concern to the managers <clears throat> on the contrary other two predators panthers and crocodile are the main uh, main problem in gujarat <clears throat> if you look at lions once they roared right from iran to afghanistan asia minor pakistan peshawar to lahore right up to gwalior and in the east up to allahabad but due to its majestic nature and a a, a very a, a a very very self contained uh, behavior this was slowly slowly hunted down and this hunting was mainly by elites by rich people kings and rulers because they drew great pleasure in killing such animals a stage came round about 1900 that only about 30 animals were left in ismar islands of gir <clears throat> uh, next slide please next slide now the now if you look to the if you look to the you have to look to the broader perspective how does this conflict exist you see they this this has a different different magnitude and different ecosystem under which the conflict uh, exists and lions live you see in this century we have about 800 maldhari maldhari are cattle rearers they have been living with lions uh, Uh, since since hundreds of years now we were suggested by people in 1973 that uh, they are nuisance to the lion so if you remove them from the sanctuary perhaps the conditions of lion will improve with the result that about 70% of them were removed from the sanctuary now again there is a question for recognition that perhaps it was not a, a very correct step to take by the forest department anyway i leave this issue to the academic to solve once for all is a different part different aspect that these very maldaris <coughs> were offered uh, agricultural lands in grasslands and uh, which they could never cultivate please early side which you could never cultivate and slowly slowly again came back to the protected areas only in addition to this in this protected area of gir we have about 15 forest settlement villages these villages were established in the past by uh, nabab of juragad to help the forest operation in the sanctuary areas <clears throat> they are still there in addition there is there is a railway track going through the sanctuary main sanctuary this length is about 15 km over and above this seven state highways uh, 
uh, over a distance of over 100 kilometers pass through this protected area. There are there are there are local rituals associated with this animal in and around Gir. Now, in addition to this, there are about we 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 have about 175 to 200 takers to keep a watch and gather the information about the different prices of lion in this century. So they give, go around every day in the morning and come late in the evening, bringing them different information about different prices, what happened to them, uh, how many of lions went to heat, uh, whom, which lion they met, uh, births were given to how many cups, all that information. In additional information on ecosystem is passed over by evening, every day by them. In addition, you see, we have about 800, 800 personnel of forest department working for the management of the century. So in short, you see, there is so much of human interaction with lion that there is not a single day where lion does not see a man or a man does not see a lion. So there is a, with, with this sort of situation existing, there is a mutual respect between lion and man. Lion has realized that man is not a danger to it, and men realize that lion is not a danger to it, like tiger and panther, which is happening elsewhere. And this has resulted into a sort of a mutual respect. And that's why this conflict is not so acute. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide. Now, you, uh, if you look to the... Hello? Hello? Now, Previous slide, please. This is a long slide. Previous Is this fine, sir? This is the slide on food of lions. Yes, sir. The, the right slide is there. Food of lions. Sir, can you hear us? Am I audible, sir? Uh, sir, you have to unmute. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Now, you see, if you look to the food of lion, before 1970, in the early, late 60s, you see, domestic animal used to be the main food for lion because the prey based, the herbivorous animal were not an, in enough number available in the protected area. So most of the food for lion was domestic animals. But over the, over the time, since the population of uh, prey base has improved, now the habits are also changing. Today, the main food of lion is constituted by chital and sambar. You will be surprised to know that in such a small area of 1500 to 2000 square kilometer, we have as much as about 75 to 80,000 chital about 8,000 of uh, Sambar, or 5,000 of Nilgai, and over 4,000 of wild pigs, which make the main food for lion. In, in addition, you see lions also kill uh, cattle in a round, in, especially in peripheral areas. They are killing around about 3,000 to 4,000 animals per year. And our, our uh, recent research uh, result indicate that 75% of the food of lion currently coming from wildlife, whereas only about 35% is constituted by the domestic animals. <clears throat> One important aspect has to be noticed about this nature of food is that there is a seasonal variation. In summer, there, when <clears throat> this water dries in gill, there are only certain places where water is available, which we call them water holes, which we augment through uh, uh, through uh, the, through tankers, so most of the herbivores also gather around this water hole, and it is easy for lion to have his food in around the water hole. So in summer, the uh, the amount of the proportion of natural natural uh, natural food of chital and sambar at certain increases, whereas in other seasons it decreases. Next slide, please. Now, one, I have to one we have to consider is 
<clears throat> the present pressure of this uh, this uh, 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 this animal on the existing ecosystem. The present population of the land is about 674, which we counted in the year 2020. Now, this population uh, is much more beyond the carrying capacity of the PA. Our PA extends to over 2,000 square kilometers or so. This carrying capacity is only about 300 or so. Rest of the lines, more than half of the lines, therefore, are pushed out of the PA. <clears throat> and these satellite lines have found out their own uh, the, the, the habitat, which are mostly our grasslands uh, in adjoining areas. Consequently, we have to declare three major grasslands also as a PS. <clears throat> some, some, some incidents of lion moving away from the PA is as far as 150 kilometers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, sir. The slide is on human deaths or uh, leopard and crocodile. No, you, you missed this. You missed this. Okay. Next. Now, you see, we also have to take a note. No, next. Next slide, please. Now, we have to also look what are the management problems in managing these lines uh, in such a large number of lines in such a small area. Now, if you look back at the history, uh, there were about only 300, uh, 30 lines are left by 1900 in this in this small area of Gir. Now, <clears throat> these these were the famine years. There, there was a three years famine from 1899 to 1900, and that's why the number went down because because hunting was very easy in those famine years. Vegetation density, vegetation decreased, and this was the year when the Nawab of Jhagat wanted to please the uh, the Governor General, the then Governor General Jack, uh, uh, Lord Curzon, and invited him for a lion hunt. Now the Curzon came to know about the plight of the lions. He made a condition with the Nawab that I'll come to Jhagat provided you declare total ban of hunting online and this was a turning uh, turning point thereafter a total ban was put by the nabab and by subsequent government on hunting of lions <clears throat> it, it was it was during this land this this indicate the behavior of man towards the animal this was the, also the year when maharaja of gwalior requested uh, the government of india to send about 8 10 lions to gwalior because it, lion existed in the past in Gwalior area, but Lord Curzon refused his request. Consequently, angered by the uh, by the turn down his request by Lord Curzon, Maharaja of Gwalior brought about eight ten African lions and tried to propagate them in his area, but they all disappeared for very obvious reasons because the behavior of uh, uh, behavior of African lions and the and the attitudes of local population towards them is totally different what is existing in around Gir. <clears throat> Even if you if you go still ahead in history, this uh, this century was declared legally under Indian Forest Indian Indian Forest Act in eight, 1985, and the population thereafter has not looked back. It has been ever increasing. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, <clears throat> now this, this slide shows the how there has been increased the population of lion. With actually, in, uh, initially in 1965, we have only a, a protected area of 150 uh, square kilometer. But as the lion population increased, they started moving to the adjoining area. And as they moved to adjoining areas, the adjoining areas had to be added as a PS. As on today, we have about 2,000 square kilometers uh, of protected areas. Now, if you look at the slide, though there are 31 in 1983, but today they have gone as high as 330. Uh, uh, every year, they're increasing quite a good number. Next slide, please. 
नेक्स्ट स्लाइड नेक्स्ट स्लाइड इस और पेंसर को कोडाइल नाउ यू सी वी हैव वी हैव मैनेजमेंट प्रॉब्लम इन मैनेजिंग दिस एनिमल्स एंड मेन प्रॉब्लम इज दैट दिस लैंडस्केप ऑफ फेयर लायन एग्जिस्टेड हैव बीन फ्रेगमेंटेड एंड द इकोसिस्टम हैज डिग्रेडेड इट इज मेनली बिकॉज a uh, lot of forest lands have been given out under political pressures to the local inhabitant in addition you see the lion also used to get shelter in in grazing lands and wastelands the india has about 78% of wastelands and equal amount of grazing lands but today if you try to locate them you will not a position to locate them uh, not only site they be an exist only a map they have all disappeared but they were the lands which were acting as a buffer between man and lion in addition you see uh, we have a limitation uh, we have limited capacity to accommodate the visitors there are large number of visitors are coming to gir, gir to meet lions our uh, our infrastructure to accommodate this huge amount of uh, visitor is really limited with the result that lot of resource have come around in <clears throat> come around gil now these resource uh, are a problem because they they try to sh- uh, arrange pride shows try to go right inside the clandestine inside the uh, protected areas and disturb the lion uh, this is g- posing a great problem uh, to us now another problem of management is that you see these most of these protected areas in india are surrounded by a large number of population so they are more or less as islands of protection and there is not adequate tolerance by people in addition you see the electricity supply is given to the farmers only during night and this this most of the most of these uh, animals are nocturnal in uh, nocturnal in hunting they also get out in the night for hunting and they find their their uh, their victims very easily in around these uh, uh, wells so this is uh, another policy issue which i think a management should look into it next please next now <clears throat> this in the population is increasing we will also also have to think that some uh, alternative homes has to be found for the lions because it is not very advisable to keep such a large um, large population of a uh, of a endangered species at a single spot anything may happen disease may happen some other things may happen other natural calamity may happen so we have to have some some alternative home for this lions we have tried to build a, a sub to develop alternate homes for them in near jamnagar which is in the process to so, start with we are building the uh, the base that is about uh, by, uh, we are building a suitable biodiversity for the lion to migrate them and i hope in due course we will position to take some pride of the lion to uh, to this the uh, alternate home now in the past you see experience has not been very good Uh, in case of this uh, uh, alternate home as i told you uh, in 1900 a try was made by maharaja of gwalior to uh, bring some of the uh, african lions and rear them in in, in his territory but they all disappeared yet another attempt was made in about 7 uh, 1986 or 87 where in we transported about 10 lions along with cubs and lioness to a place near barar chandrabha the wildlife sanctuary but there also you see because the local people did not appreciate the uh, nature of lion and lion did not appreciate the local nature approach of the local people so they also disappeared in 2 3 years so our attempt to uh, provide the local alternative homes outside the gujarat has been not very successful that's why the gujarat is very 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 sort of a sensitive and a, a very sort of a 
uh, uh, proud to have the lions here. Main reason is that you see, lions is different than other predators. It, it can live with men, but if the man feels by the merely looking at the face of a lion, that he is going to kill him, that creates the problem. And that's why most of the lions in Gwalior, as well as Chandraprabha, near Banaras were killed. Another thing is that, you see, it, uh, due to strict protection, uh, in most of the PAs, the uh, population of animal in uh, in increasing and carrying capacity of these PAs remains the same. So we also have to uh, find out alternative means to uh, to 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 keep the animal within the carrying capacity because most of the conflict arise when the carrying capacity of a PA is limited. So animal try to get their food and shelter outside the PAs. <clears throat> Another aspect is the improvement of habitat. You see, with the with the with the different management uh, approach, the habitat are, are also getting changed. Say, take in case of uh, uh, elephants. You see, due to strict protection of uh, forest, the uh, tree cover in these element habitats have have in <coughs> have increased. With the result that there are not adequate grasses in the forest which elephants used to pass. With the result, now they migrate early and in large numbers. And this creates a problem. In addition, the corridors which were available to them, they could go, they could move from one place to another under the tree cover. Also, those the tree cover has disappeared, which has brought the animals in the very close vicinity of human beings. This is also creating a problem. Next slide, please. Next slide. Another thing is the awareness. You see, people are not aware about the habits of the animal and, and their, their needs. So if the awareness is created in the public that they are not always harmful, it goes a long way. This awareness helps us a lot in Gujarat. You see, local people are, 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 are not enemy of lion. They, they some like the lion, they are proud of lion, and they love the lion. We have seen that, you see, whenever a, a, a cattle is killed, a cattle is killed by lion, the men immediately inform our rescue center, and by the time we go there, he is already ready to help us with the coat, with the, with the, with the, with the ropes, and everything, rescuing the animal. Most of these accidents are happening because this area in around gear is, is our open wells. They don't have parapet wells. So the lions, either in darkness or while chasing spray, fell into these wells. So most of the accidents or most of the rescue operations involved are rescuing these animals from the well. But local people, we get a tremendous, uh, tremendous help from the local people. They, 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 uh, they don't hate the animal so much that it's better if he killed in the well. He tries to save us and help us in rescuing operation. Another important thing is that you see, we also have to uh, train our people personal in rescuing the wild animals. And I am proud that in Gujarat we have developed the art that you see we we can re we rescue most of the animals. 